Left podcast, a show about Indiana politics, history, and culture from the unapologetic perspective of the Hoosier Left. My name is Scott Aaron Rogers, and I'm recording from Bloomington. A couple months ago, my friend Alexa Scott joined me for an episode to talk about the exploitative business model of big-time college sports. We got into the student-athlete organizing and uh, potential unionization before delving into the capture of the entire higher education system by corporate forces. Whereas post-secondary education was free or extremely affordable in the post-World War II era, by the late 1960s, in response to anti-war student activism and led by then-California Governor Ronald Reagan, conservatives began to rule back these subsidies. By the end of Reagan's first presidential term, less than 20 years later, federal grants decreased, student loans greatly increased, and education debt exploded. Since 1980, in addition to reducing financial support to students, governments have also greatly reduced uh, funding to public colleges and universities themselves. This has led to rising tuitions for a lower quality education. Fewer tenure-track uh, tenure professors, more and more classes being taught by part-time, poorly paid adjuncts, and a greater burden placed on graduate student employees. And, at colleges and universities nationwide, those exploited grad student workers are organizing to fight back. In 2014, there were about 50 graduate employee unions at schools in the U.S. By July of 2023, that number had more than tripled. In the fall of 2018, responding to Trump administration attempts to tax tuition remission, grad employees protested across the country, including at my alma mater, Indiana University. A small group of participants at IU met after the protest on campus to begin thinking about forming some kind of graduate employee advocacy group. Here, the Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition was born. My guest today is Zara Anwarzai. According to her profile on Phil People, the online community for philosophers, Zara is a PhD candidate in philosophy and cognitive science at IU Bloomington. Her main work is on the social dimension of skill and expertise with broad interests in social metaphysics, cognition, evolution, language, and technology. She is also interested in connections between skill and technology in the realm of work and labor. With her interest in work and labor, it is fitting that Zara is active with the coalition serving as organizing coordinator. In today's conversation, we cover the history and mission of the Grad Workers Coalition at IU, the sheer amount of work these students are responsible for, what their pay actually amounts to for all that work, the support they've received from their faculty supervisors, the lack of support they've received from administrators, hostility to labor organizing by the state government, the process of building solidarity among a diverse group, their goals for a potential strike, and coordinating with similar organizations at other colleges and universities. But first, if you find value in conversations like these, I could really use your help. As someone who recently suffered a tragic loss in my family, my entire perspective on life has changed. And now that I've known real grief, I feel called to make an, uh, Indiana a place with less of that suffering, especially the kind inflicted by our lawmakers. So I, perhaps imprudently, walked away from my job and have devoted myself full-time to the Who's Left Project. This work is dedicated to calling out the Republican supermajority, their financial backers, and others in their network that actively work to make Hoosier lives worse. Those whose policies endanger our children through lax gun regulation, bullying queer youth, and poisoning our environment. I work to highlight these bad actors so we can replace them with more empathetic leadership and also shine the spotlight on the Hoosier activists, organizations, and elected officials who are doing the hard work to build a more just, equitable, and compassionate Indiana for the next generation of Hoosiers. But I cannot do this without you. I am driven to provide information and analysis you won't get anywhere else in the Hoosier state. Still, all the passion and conviction in the world doesn't pay the ever-mounting bills, and I am falling behind. 
I could really use your financial support with a paid subscription over at scottaaronrogers.substack.com. For $5 a month or $50 a year, you can help me push our state in a better direction and help my family in the process. And even if a paid subscription doesn't work for you at this time, you can still help. Subscribe at the free level over on Substack. Set your favorite podcast player to auto-download new episodes of the show. Rate and review the podcast on whatever platform you use. Follow me on social media at facebook.com slash who's left. That's H-O-O-S left. I'm also now on Blue Sky at the same handle. I'm personally at Scott Raj 78 that's S-C-O-T-T-R-O-G-7-8, on Instagram, threads, and the platform everybody still calls Twitter. I'm also on Mastodon at scottraj78 at hoosier.social. I'm now also posting video, too. Full episodes on YouTube and clips on TikTok. The handle on both of those is at who's left. But most importantly, share our message. Forward the articles to friends, family, and random people alike. Don't just like, but share on social media. Hire a flock of messenger uh, pigeons to spread the word. With your investment, a full-time who's left looks like new content every day. I'm currently doing a series of profiles on Indiana's most influential political donors called the Smoligarchs. It looks like full coverage of the 2024 election cycle in Indiana and beyond. And it looks like zooming out to see how the malevolent forces at work in our state function nationally and even globally. It might not be in my financial interest, but I do not plan on paywalling any content because I believe in open access to information and your support makes that content freely available to all Hoosiers. But I desperately need your investment in order to keep bringing you meaningful content. To those who have contributed already, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I appreciate every last penny, and it means the world to me and to everybody. Thanks for listening. Here's my interview with Zara Anwarzai. Zara Anwarzai, thank you for joining the Who's Left podcast. Hi, Scott. So, you are here today as representative of the uh, Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition. Tell us about the coalition and its mission. So the coalition is a group of graduate workers at Indiana University Bloomington. So teachers, researchers, um, yeah, graders, people who are doing both instructional and teaching um, and research labor at the university um, who are also graduate students. So we began organizing, I would say, really seriously um, in 2019. So when we first started organizing then, the conditions were pretty dire. So the annual salary was about $15,000 a year. Um, On top of that, we were paying, um, you know, sort of at minimum $1,200 a year in fees. International students would almost pay double that. Students in the Jacob School of Music would pay $1,000 on top of that. So really some people's take home pay was closer to $10,000 a year sometimes. So yeah, it was it was super dire. People were living in poverty, selling blood, uh, you know, taking out enormous amounts of credit card debt, taking on second and third jobs. And the conditions were just really ripe for a good organizing drive. So we began really by organizing around the fees, which were, again, that chunk of money that we were paying back to the university, which included things like a technology fee. So, you know, we were paying for the computers that we would use to teach. Oh, what? So yeah, pretty pretty absurd kind of pay to pay to work system. Um, and so we organized around that because regardless of the level of pay, you know, in chemistry, people were making maybe twenty thousand dollars at that time, whereas um in philosophy it was sixteen. Um, regardless of the amount of pay, everyone paid those fees. So it was something that affected mm-hmm. everyone and everyone could rally around it. So we started with a big fee town hall, which got 200 people there to talk about how absurd these fees were. We then launched launched a petition. Um, and then we had this huge fee march with hundreds of, of grad workers going to deliver the petition to the administration. Um, and then started, you know, the kind of more um, militant sort of taking on of this uh, huge, you know, uh, 
huge entity that is Indiana University. So we started with a fee strike um, where, you know, hundreds of workers pledged to not pay their fees for one semester. Um, eventually, we called off the fee strike, COVID hit, but then the, as many of the fees were eliminated at that point, not all by any means, um, but we had some victories. Soon after, in I guess 2021, um, in the fall of 2021, we began an organizing drive where we began collecting union cards. We knew from the start that there's not a clear pathway towards union recognition for public employees in Indiana. So that was from the get go on our radar. Yeah. And so we knew that we were going to have to build towards a strike when we were already collecting union cards. So we got the majority of graduate workers to sign union cards. Um, we filed for an election. Or so we sort of filed those cards to the university administration asking for them to voluntarily recognize us or voluntarily um, host an election uh, for a union. They, of course, said no, um, you know, and after a series of kind of ridiculous and absurd uh, confrontations and them ignoring us, you know, at many of the wrong moments, um, it was clear that our members were ready to go on strike. So we um, started by having, you know, tons, like hundreds of one-on-one -on -one conversations about a strike, what it would mean, what it would look like. Um, we eventually got a thousand people to sign a strike pledge, pledging to you know, withhold their labor indefinitely. Um, we had a super successful uh, strike authorization vote where a thousand and eight people voted to um, endorse, uh, sort of authorize the strike. And then we went on strike for four weeks um, in the spring of 2022. Um, at the end, there was a lot of momentum from the faculty in support of our strike, and you could kind of feel the power balance on campus shifting where everyone, mm -hmm. you know, in Bloomington, everyone on campus was in favor of the strike except for like 10 administrators in the Board of Trustees. And so we decided to call off the strike, or not call off, but postpone the strike into the fall because um, of tons of considerations, which, you know, um, we could talk about for days about uh, striking in the summer. And um, before the strike date, which we had projected for the fall, um, I think like maybe three weeks before we ended up getting um, the elimination of all fees, including the international fees on campus, um, a 45% base pay increase from at the time it was, you know, in, in at the beginning of 2021, it was eight, it was 16,000, I think. And at the beginning of 2020, to fall, it was uh, 22,000. So it was an enormous, um, yeah, like life-changing raise. A lot of people stayed in the program who were planning on otherwise dropping out. A lot of graduate workers were lifted out of poverty. Um, and it was incredible. And, you know, unfortunately in the past two years, we've had, uh, you know, record high inflation, the cost of basic goods has skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the cost of, of rent in Bloomington has skyrocketed. So even though we made these enormous gains, they're nowhere near sufficient for graduate workers to live in dignity. So that's where we are today. Yeah, I wanted to ask about, you know, those those numbers you shot off toward the beginning about, you know, maybe making fifteen, sixteen, twenty thousand dollars tops. How many hours a week are you guys putting in for that kind of salary? Well, it's funny because and this is something the administration tries to call attention to, our contracts state that we're part time employees who should work at at maximum 20 hours a week. But I don't know a single grad worker who works 20 hours a week. And I'm not talking about the work they do on their research, which I understand why that's supposed to kind of happen mm -hmm. on your own time. So at one point, um, I was teaching a class. Um, I was teaching, I was the sort of teaching assistant for three sections, Intro to Cognitive Science, which meant that I had 99 students who I was responsible for teaching every Friday, grading all of their work, preparing three different sections, and actually hosting those three different sections. And one time I went and I calculated just like basic showing up, you know, how, how what does that look like? Not including sort of preparation and grading and emails with students and, you know, doing my okay. own reading. And it was 25 hours, just kind of the showing up part of it, the office hours. So on top of that, you have, you know, tons of additional work. And then you also have courses that you're taking. And then you also have your research, which is sort of a, a condition of your employment that you make progress in your research. So even though it's not technically part of your employment, it's a condition of it. So I would say that there were times when I've worked 90 hours a week. There are times when I've worked, you know, 80 hours a week. More realistically, I think your average grad worker is working 40 to 50 hours a week. In, in STEM, where students are in labs and sort of expected to um, 
you know, monitor those labs and the progress, sometimes 24 hours for their, their experiments. I think that they're regularly working 80 hours a week. So it's, a, it's certainly not 20. I'll tell you that. No. Um, okay. Uh, I wasn't a math major in my day. What does that break down to essentially hourly? If you, if you break it down. Yeah. Um, that's it, it, it's, yeah, what is that is actually? This, is this even minimum wage? Oh, um, no. <laughs> I think that um, you know, in fact, um, I think this is like the 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 dean of the the assistant dean of the College of Arts and Sciences recently, when we sort of launched this year's campaign for more pay more say, sent out an email to the College of Arts and Sciences saying, Oh, well, in fact, you're actually making twenty three hours when you break it down by twenty hours a week. But of course, we're not working twenty hours a week. So it's it's certainly uh yeah far below minimum wage let's see if someone is making eighty thousand dollars <laughs> and um you know they're working or sorry working 80 hours and they're um whatever being paid 23 let's see gosh sorry scott i have to do math <laughs> okay 19, oh, 1916 i don't have this <laughs> Yeah, it's about four hundred seventy nine dollars a week, and if you, you know, let's say you're, yeah, it's about five dollars an hour if I did the math right. Ah, uh, wow, yeah. So, I mean, you you can't even like pull a kid in off the street and pay them five dollars an hour in any other job in town. But yeah, this is, you know, graduate workers with specific skill sets in their chosen field of study, and valued less than any other employee on campus basically yeah. um how would you describe the relationship with faculty like your direct uh you know supervisors the, the professors you're working under have they been supportive or combative or is it you know does it vary I would say overwhelmingly the faculty at Indiana University have been in support of the graduate workers um, union and the strike and a possible um, upcoming strike. Because I think that we made it clear from the get go that we're fighting the same fight in many respects. Sorry. Um, you know, we're, we're fighting for resources in the departments we're fighting for you know money to be funneled into the classrooms and this is what a lot of department heads spend their time doing they're trying to get more money to make their programs more competitive you know when you have other grad programs which are paying people 30 40 sometimes fifty thousand dollars a year now you know you're losing out on the competitive phd applicants and so this is something that has been i think on faculty's radar for a really long time um, and I think because we sort of intentionally messaged that we were fighting the same fight, it was easy to build coalition there. Um, I should say to the the faculty towards the end of our 2022 strike, um, they hosted this kind of like almost unprecedented all faculty meeting, which is when you have to get like, you, you know, you sort of. I think the quorum on um, all of the faculty in Bloomington is is like 800 faculty, and I think they had like 750 there. And they passed resolutions in favor of union recognition against retaliation. So overwhelmingly, there's support from the faculty. I think one of the things that we do also try to, um, you know, respect and talk to our members about is the fact that at this, you know, faculty mentorship relationships are kind of like a strange kind of management relationship because technically this is your mm -hmm. boss right you can get fired by the supervisor um on your project and it's good if they support the union and it makes it a lot easier you know there's like sort of fewer psychological barriers of entry to participate um if they like are even indifferent or just to say i'm you know i'm neutral um but it's also you, we can't rely on that <laughs> because you know yeah. part of part of i think what we want to organize for also is like you know, a fair grievance system where if people have reasonable grievances against their advisors or the supervisors in their labs, that they can take them to someone and have them be treated um, neutrally and fairly and like have some kind of third party arbitration, which we just 
utterly lack right now. And I think that's a real problem for, yeah. for all in, uh, you know universities, that there's this complicated relationship between the grad workers and the, their faculty. But yeah, so we're lucky to have a lot of support. We also, you know, recognize that you can never fully rely on support and also that there's still, you know, members who deal with faculty who are openly hostile to the union. Um, but we've tried to sort of systematically, uh, you know, nudge those faculty and just say, hey, in Indiana, even at a place like this, you know, it is technically a, a misdemeanor to intimidate or interfere with a union election drive. So be careful. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, not to cross that line. Um, faculty are, are unionized, right? They're, they're organized? No, the faculty, or... yeah. No, no, there, there's, um, yeah, the faculty at Indiana University Bloomington are not unionized. Um, there's an AAUP chapter, an American Association of University Professors chapter. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. but there's no, yeah. So the staff here, there's a staff union, but there's no faculty union. Interesting. Um, because I know, I mean, in, 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 uh, in recent decades now i mean this has been happening ever since reagan but uh faculty at universities are increasingly mistreated as well you know they're losing tenure protection uh they're they're using adjuncts and and associate professors and graduate workers to do a lot of the work and and there are less tenured tenure track full-time good paying uh academic positions is, is is that accurate yeah that i i think especially these threats to tenure are uh totally reflective of the situation we have um at indiana right now um there there's been a lot of faculty organizing a, around and against um recent bills like uh sb202 which uh you know Mm -hmm. sort of introduces uh, new ways of revoking tenure, which is just absolutely absurd. Um, there's There have been threats to like academic freedom for professors on campus. So tenured, there was a tenured professor who was suspended over a room reservation, which um, had to do with, you know. Um, oh, I heard about yeah, that. Yeah, his, yeah, right, right, right. Like, a, quote unquote, a room reservation, but really it was a room reservation for the Palestine Solidar Solidarity Committee, an undergraduate group who was hosting a speaker. So it's kind of like blatant and <laughs> outright you know um attempts to undermine academic freedom which you know thankfully it's been incredible to see the faculty really rally around um you know one another in these moments and kind of uh stand up to the administration who has not been vocally supportive of faculty or not been vocally you know against bills like sb202 so um yeah i think that the future of faculty organizing is is really bright um but unfortunately because there have been so many terrible catalysts for uh you know that kind of organizing sure um yeah no, that's that's where i wanted to go next was to to talk about the response from uh the administration uh president pam Whitten on down uh the trustees sounds like there's been a lot of pushback uh on that end yeah yeah, definitely. So um, I think that there's a yeah, I, I would I would say when it comes to the union, it seems like um, the administration's sort of uh, policy line is don't talk about it, don't look at it, don't acknowledge it, um, you know, don't respond to any requests to meet, which I think is, you know, um, probably some really solid anti-union uh like legal advice they received but i think it's absolutely an like undemocratic way to interact with the workers of your campus especially when the majority of a portion of the workers like the majority of graduate workers 1300 people are like knocking on your door asking for a meeting or a response and you can't even you know dignify like uh them with acknowledgement of receipt of the petition or anything like that it's it's pretty absurd so so when it comes to that there's just been absolute silence for them uh they want to hold the line that the question has been settled of course we're not settling for that the question is not settled <laughs> um you know until we have a living wage and union recognition um and even then whatever the contract you know negotiations begin and bargaining begins with respect to some of the like um yeah, incidences of like undermining shared governance and uh, academic freedom and, uh, you know, protecting tenure. I think the the administration has been 
a mix of uh, tight-lipped and kind of like upsettingly um, unserious about their responses. So in response to, um, you know, there was there was the exhibition of um, Samia Halabi, a Palestinian artist that was canceled. It was planned for three years mm-hmm. on Ainu's cam- campus and then was canceled at the last minute. Uh, the provost's only comment, I think, in a faculty meeting was um, there were security concerns. Um, and so this sort of like, uh, yeah, unwillingness to take serious the hurt the um you know embarrassment that people um from iu sort of like had to suffer by being part of an institution that treats you know invited artists like that um was kind of absurd Mm -hmm. um with respect to sb202 i think the most that anyone got out of uh president Whitten, and i think then this this is anecdotal so um you know take take this as you will um was it's not a great bill or something like that. But no vocal support. No, this would threaten our ability to have a functioning, healthy academic community. Um, you know, no sort of indication that this threatens the educational mission of this institution. None of that. So I think that's what's really concerning. You know, even just sort of like verbally, there's no reassurance that they care about the educational mission of Indiana University. The president is hired by the trustees right right and the trustees the majority of them are appointed by the governor who in this state has been a republican for 20 years now right um and republicans are openly hostile to uh public education period Mm -hmm. so uh, how do we like how do we even negotiate in good faith with an administration where you know going in they are they're they're hostile to organized labor they're hostile hostile to education period um how how were you working toward getting over that hurdle yeah i think I think there are two dimensions to it. Like, I think on the one hand, it's it's really important to call attention to the extent to which, um, you know, public tax dollars and student tuition dollars are being diverted away from classrooms and, you know, towards like private interests, like for profit medical facilities and like defense contractors, which in like President Witten, you know, will proudly share uh, that, you know, we have this new deal with this DOD contractor. And I think like, you know, what little public funding is already sort of allocated to Indiana University, it's being diverted in these really alarming ways. And I think that people should be aware of that. I, you know, I'm from Indiana and I grew up with tons of people really seeing Indiana or, or you know, whatever sort of Indiana University they went to as just like fundamental to their idea and their 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 identity and their culture and like you know their experience as an adult and i think that that can be really you know Mm -hmm. important and rewarding and i think if people knew how you know bad the sort of funneling of the money was they would be you know willing to kind of rally around that so i think there's this sort of like bigger dimension but then i think that there is a lot that we can accomplish with organizing because again we're we're up against this billion dollar corporation and we're trying to move them to transfer some of their wealth back into the classrooms, like to their workers, to their professors, to their staff. And that will radically improve the quality of public education, you know, at this institution to have um, people who aren't working second jobs, to have people who are committed to this institution in the long run and to have, you know, like staff that aren't constantly turning over because they can't live on the salary that they're receiving. And so just having a better functioning university like that would already just like, yeah, vastly sort of improve things. And and I also, yeah, I get it. We're up against, you know, um, a governor that's like super hostile to organized labor in general. And I think that, you know, we're very clear about the kind of ideological battle that we're fighting um, with the state. And I think that our members have grown so confident over the past two years that this is a battle worth fighting, not just for us, but for the state in general. Um, You know, some of the most exciting times are when um, like union members from uh, elsewhere in southern Indiana will come in and just say more people joined our union after your strike. Um, 
you know, and, and I think that that's really what, like, uh, you know, whatever the Indiana governor is af- afraid of, that more people are going to join unions, that more people are going to grow more and more militant, be, uh, you know, unafraid to 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 fight the boss. When we started organizing our union drive, the, the number of sort of, like, basic misconceptions that we would hear, like, is it legal to have a union in Indiana? Like, people don't know what right to work means. Um, is it legal to strike in Indiana? Like, all these things are just, like, myths that have been proliferated by like bosses and the government and like we just have to really work towards that slowly so yeah yeah, i think it's just it's a process of actual wealth transfer and public consciousness raising about like what kind of system and what kind of game indiana university is running um and like how they're playing fast and loose with everyone's tax dollars um and you know even even then they're like still sort of like making a big stink about the value of public education. Like clearly you value this institution because you sort of, I don't know, built it into a money-making enterprise. Um, so you're going to yeah. keep putting something into it. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so, you know, what do you say to them? They're, they're, the, the, the Republican line is going to be something like, oh, well, you know, yeah. we're, we're being good stewards of the citizens' tax dollars, and and you know we're fiscally responsible, or and and these you know these these graduate students are they're students, they're not employees, you know they, they already receive stipends and benefits and tuition waivers, you know what do you what do you say to these guys who who, who come at you like that? Yeah, so many things. I think first, um, you know the the sort of our one status of Indiana University depends on the number of PhD students for a reason, because PhD students are absolutely mm-hmm. integral to the research output of universities. And I can tell you that if all the graduate students in chemistry walked out today, you know, that department would shut down um, very quickly. Um, and so so sort of like disregard the idea that we're here to receive training i think you know in in some respects of course this is an academic training process i've learned an enormous amount in my phd and i'm so glad i did it and i'll be a better professor than i would have been without it you know um but on the other hand to act like throughout that training process i haven't contributed enormously to this university is absurd i think graduate students teach upwards of 30 percent of the instructional like uh, they they do 30% of the instructional labor on campus. So we teach our own courses. We don't just assist, you know, in the languages, there are students who teach two courses a semester, um, which is, you know, not much different from what a lecturer teaches. And on top of that, they're publishing papers and they're publishing, you know, whatever they're, they're working on their dissertation, which they're going to credit to this institution. Um, on top, so so the the one thing I would say is the work that we do is just kind of functionally indistinguishable from the work that many faculty and researchers do on this campus. Mm-hmm. So that distinction just doesn't apply. It's just that on top of that, we're getting some training, and on top of that, you know, we're approaching uh, teaching maybe with like a little bit I don't know like hu- more humility than your average professor because we know that we're kind of uh, still in a phase where we should be learning things. Um, but on the other hand, the sort of tuition waivers and all of those those things. I'm in my sixth year right now. I haven't taken classes for three years and I'm still getting a tuition waiver. And so it's just money that the university is putting right back into its own pocket, right? Like I don't take Mm -hmm. courses and to suggest that my compensation is actually upwards of $60,000 is just confused. Like not only can I not use that um, to pay rent and groceries, but I also don't need that because that's, you know, you take classes for a very short time during your PhD. So I think, um, yeah, the, the, there's just a lot of confusion on what we do and what our role is in in this institution. So what strategies is uh, the coalition using to mobilize support and build solidarity uh, among the grad workers? So I would say our, our sort of most potent tool is the organizing conversation. So we always are trying to have one-on-one conversations with as many members as possible. So currently we're, um, we, we began this year with a campaign for more pay and more say. So we launched yet another union drive. We collected new union cards from members during our last, you know, our last drive was two years ago. Our last union drive was now three years ago. Um, so we have tons of new people on this campus. So we wanted to talk to them and we think every member deserves a conversation about what the union is and what it can do and what it wants to do. 
So we had those conversations. Um, we got 1300 graduate workers in addition to also like, you know, I think like 300 fellows. So fellows are people who are kind of like paid to write. That's a whole other thing. But we got 1300 graduate mm -hmm. workers to sign union cards. Um, and then we made a demand for a union election. And then we, you know, that demand went unanswered. And so we met as membership to sort of map out our next steps. And our membership endorsed um, having conversations about whether to go on strike. So at every stage, I think also solidarity building, we're not only having these one-on-one -on -one conversations, we're bringing them back to like organizing committees every week where we're, you know, like we have organizers from departments across campus who come back and say, here's what the folks in math think. Here's what the folks in education think. Here's what the folks in philosophy think. Um, and so we synthesize those conversations. We try to build our, our strategy on the basis of them. And then we bring that strategy to our members um, who maybe don't come to those weekly meetings. And we, you know, I would say the majority of our members have an enormous amount of trust in, in the organizing committee because they, you know, read the emails, they show up they, to the general membership meeting, they vote, and that's the extent of their union involvement. And that's totally fine. Um, but we want to make sure that for those members, you know, who aren't the most active, um, that they're still sort of involved in the process um, to the extent that they can be. So after our demand went unanswered, we, um, you know, engaged in this process. We went to our membership and we decided to initiate um, conversations about uh, striking with our members. So over the past um, three weeks or so, we talked to over 500 of our members about whether they would go on strike um, if, in fact, we did move towards that. And the overwhelming majority were not only down to strike, they were, um, many were down to organize the strike, which I think is a really exciting thing and sort of shows the, the, the growth of our organization and also its longevity. Because, you, you know, if you're in a position where 300 people want to organize a strike, like you're, you're in good business. Um, and the rest were um, overwhelmingly neutral. The, I think it was like almost 80% were ready to strike or organize the strike and the rest were neutral in a, who oh, fewer than 10 were like, I refuse to go on strike even before, you know, hearing about it, which is pretty phenomenal out of 500. So once we reached 500, we sort of came back together again as an organizing committee and looked at those numbers. Where are those numbers? You know, is it that one department's really down to strike, but another isn't? And we found that sort of across departments, the distribution held. People were, you know, overwhelmingly positively in favor of a strike. Um, and so now what we're doing is once again bringing a proposal back to our membership on the basis of kind of like our analyses of these 500 assessments. So today we're actually having this um, strike town hall. It's March 22nd, um, where we're presenting a, a, a tentative strike plan to our membership. Um, and to, in fact, we've opened this meeting to faculty, staff, and undergraduate students because whenever possible, we want to sort of open the lines of dialogue um, with every party on campus mm -hmm. so they kind of know what's going on and never feel blindsided. Um, you know, when we don't show up to work. So um, we're having this town hall. We're going to, you know, present a plan, answer questions, take public comments um, from the floor. And then this weekend, our organizers will, will once again meet and vote about whether to actually put out a strike pledge. Um, and sort of depending on how that strike pledge goes, we would then move towards authorizing um, a strike vote or sort of we would go towards a strike authorization vote, which would actually trigger the strike. So your question was about building solidarity and sort of building the union. I think part of what we do is we try to make this process as transparent to people as possible. We try to make it clear where they can come in, where they can have input. We also try to be as democratic as possible, which is that, you know, once the majority of members have kind of decided on a plan, like, let's talk about strikes, we don't walk it back, right? If one person's like, wait, yeah. I'm afraid of a strike, we say, listen, you know, like, come to organizing committee, we'll, tr we'll talk about it. But the, the majority has spoken and we're moving in this direction. So we really want that each of those majority of steps have as much buy-in as possible, especially because we're in a place without a clear path to union recognition. So a lot of these strategies are like, you know, they're, 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 they're new, they're experimental, right? Like we, we sort of know it's tried and true, but we want there to be enormous amount of buy-in from our members because we can't point to some paper and some NLRB process and say, this is what we're doing. We have to make sure people actually understand it and are excited about it. Yeah. Um, so regarding this, this, this current, uh, you know, potential labor action, what are you maybe striking over like what are what are the demands um 
in, for, for this particular action. Yeah. So our, our ultimate demand is still and will always be until it's fulfilled union recognition. Um, this is our members are by and large convinced the only way we can ensure um, reliable annual, f you know, fair wages um, and like things like a grievance uh, procedure. So, so that's that's the goal that never gives. Um, but we also, I think, with each strike, have to kind of think about whether we're going to spell out clear success conditions to the administration. Like, if you do X, we will stop. Um, and the thing that we're leaning towards, and I think still need to solidify with our members, is a strike for a raise. Um, so currently, um, they the the most recent raise that was announced was to twenty three thousand dollars. I should say the fact that we even are getting an annual raise is absolutely a result of our organizing. We went before the strike mm -hmm. ten years without a campus wide raise, and since the strike, we've had four campus wide raises or near campus wide because I think one unit was excluded from one of the raises. So without that pressure, you know, the continuous pressure of a strike this semester, a future strike next semester or next year or in the future, um, we know that they're going to lose any pressure, any incentive to give us a raise. Um, so if this is kind of, I think the strike really is, yeah, if, if we go on strike this time, it might be that if they give us a raise, we'll call off the strike. But part of that is us really solidifying the relationship that the university has chosen with us, which is a, a relationship of striking and not of bargaining at a table. You know, every time we want to we want a raise, we call a strike. OK, if that's how they want to play it. Sure. Um, seems a lot, um, a lot worse yeah. for them than it is for us. But OK, like we can we can play that game if that's the game. OK, so. How do you see the union or the coalition at this point, I guess, evolving in the next, um, you know, handful of years and even then going forward past that? Yeah, I'm, I'm really optimistic about where it's going to go. Um, in our union drive in fall 2023, um, the majority of people who signed union cards were first and second years. So I think that already is very exciting because it suggests that there are people who, um, you know, it's not just the fifth, sixth and seventh years who are organizing this who have been around. It's, it's the people who just showed up who want it to stay um, and who want to build it. Um, and many of our or, like department organizers are also first or second years, which is phenomenal. Um, where we're thinking in the long term is um, expanding beyond Indiana University Bloomington and building coalition with other universities um, across the state, including Purdue, including IU Indianapolis and IU's other um, regional campuses. Um, you know, they have graduate workers, too, who face very similar um issues and circumstances to the ones that we face. Um, and we know also that, you know, these these universities are kind of like looking at, over each other's shoulders to figure out um, how to avoid the next labor action. So actually, when we got a raise, that, that sort of massive 45 percent raise, Purdue also got a raise. Um, so, you know, we want to sort of strategize around that their attempts to avoid, you know, labor action and just say, no, we're all in this together. We're going to plan this together. We're going to time this together. Um, and we're going to make this a statewide thing, you know, um, and possibly plan towards a statewide strike. You know, that that I think is something that we need to really like build leadership um, sort of between the campuses to figure out. But I think that's something our organizers at Bloomington are really excited about and really want to build towards. And, you know, again, we we sort of have built a model for how to organize in a state like Indiana that has hostile labor laws um, for all, but is, you know, especially for public employees. And so we also want to share that model with others. We know that you're not going to win union recognition voluntarily we recognize the sort of mm -hmm. battle that we're fighting um and so we want to make it as possible as make it as easy as possible for these other campuses to organize and to sort of like get the infrastructure that we've built import it into their own campaigns if they want so those are kind of our our hopes right now our long-term aspirations yeah that was one of the things i was going to ask about was with the with the um state of your collaboration is with the you know other universities in indiana um beyond indiana is there uh a graduate workers union at 
a particular <laughs> university or in a particular state that is that that has had um, success that you can point to that you, you you can say, hey, you know, we want to we want to do that. We want to we want to do what they're doing. Yeah, I think I think for places with the laws that we're dealing with, to my knowledge, at least, I think that we're developing a new model. Um, that's not to say that we're not relying on the models of other pro public and private universities in, you know, red and blue states and states with uh, funky, uh, whatever labor laws we've, we've like relied enormously on universities like the university of New Mexico, New Mexico state university, Michigan. Yeah. The university of Michigan, U Chicago, Northwestern. Um, so we definitely are, looking to these universities sharing strategies I, th I think the thing to sort of like take in is the fact that even if you have a clear pathway towards union recognition that doesn't mean that you stop being militant and that you stop sort of like taking on these battles as not just like legal sort of administrative battles but as as battles between workers and a boss and so for example you know our our colleagues at the university of chicago and northwestern um both of them were just finished up contract negotiations. And during those contract negotiations, they built towards huge strikes. They had two, they had bigger um, mm -hmm. units than we do. But at the U Chicago, I think 2000 people signed the strike pledge in two days. Um, and so the administration wow. immediately moved on negotiations in a way that, you know, was unprecedented. And now their base pay is, by the way, $45,000 for a cost of living that is actually quite similar to Bloomington. Um, so, you know, we're, we're taking, even though they're on a different kind of legal path, we're taking cues from them mm -hmm. um, and saying like, you know, well, what that shows us is that building towards a strike gets the university to move because, um, you know, reg regardless of if you're in Indiana or Illinois, a strike is scary to an administration. It shows that you've lost control of the campus. Sure. In Indiana, that might be more so the case. So. Yeah, we're, we're trying to sort of, um, we're taking inspiration from many places and hopefully building a model that can be replicated in other places like Indiana. And I will say we're, we're building coalition with, um, yeah, like there's, there's an effort um, to organize a union at Purdue right now. And some of our organizers are going to go speak at their sort of launching event in a few weeks. Um, there's an effort at IU Indy. And so, um, yeah. I, I think that, you know, we're we're building we're building the ship as we're flying it. And so far it's flying really well. So let's hope let's hope we can keep it up. But it's definitely, yeah, a ship being built from many different um yeah, union parts. <laughs> yeah, and, and well, you know, you mentioned like New Mexico and Illinois and Michigan and th those states uh have a lot more, I would imagine, friendly uh governments toward union organizing. You know, those are all "Quote unquote blue states," um, are are there other red states, as it were, that that are that maybe you're borrowing part of your model from? Um, yeah. Let me think. And maybe this is just the limits of my sort of like institutional knowledge. But I'm not sure about graduate workers unions in in red states. Yeah, I mean, I, I this is a question that I would have to like think about the sort of original think through with the original strategizers. I mean, it's a model we're sharing, right? Like we recently went to Bowling Green yeah. State University in Ohio um, because they sort of have similar conditions. But yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I think I think in many ways we've sort of had to, you know, and here here's why I'm pretty confident that I don't want to sort of like uh, say that we're pioneering something if we're not. And, you know, I've, obviously I want to give any institution that's done this before their flowers and my bad if I can't sort of remember who they are. But <laughs> I will say that graduate worker organizing is relatively recent, like one of the earliest unions is is from like 1995 the university of iowa um and and that they're part of the united electrical workers and so we've had uh, you know contact with their organizers mm. as well um but really the sort of specific conditions we're facing um you know i don't think there has been a, a graduate union who has who has made as many gains to this point and sort of built the infrastructure we have um in the same conditions um but i would have to think on it but uh, yeah i think i think it's it's you know again i don't want to take credit for anything that that's already been done but i think that um 
the reason why <laughs> organizing has been so exciting and so scary in Indiana is because it often feels like we're doing things that haven't been done before. Very good. So, uh, finally, how can uh, interested individuals or organizations help support the work of the Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition? Uh, alumni, you know, what can what can we do? Where can we get more information? How can we help? Yeah, well, there's tons of in information at indianagradworkers.org. Let me just make sure that's actually not Indiana graduate. Yeah, indianagradworkers.org. Um, you can find tons of information about what we're doing, what our current campaign is. Um, also links to donate. So as we're building towards a strike, um, donations are really um, important for, you know, picket signs and uh, snacks for the picket captains and vests and batteries for our megaphones and, you know, all the sort of basic things that we need to pull off a successful strike. Um, Especially thinking about alumni, um, if we do move forward with the plan that we're presenting today, um, we're going to be striking. Um, the strike will begin on April 17th, which is IU Day, which is a huge fundraising day for Indiana University. So we will be launching a counter fundraiser and would absolutely love the, the material support of any um, al alumni who are willing. I think... Yeah, the main thing is if you have an organization um, pa passing letters of support, endorsements, I think that really goes very far to show that the community is unified. You know, the the intellectual, the sort of like functional community, the, the surrounding um, Bloomington community, the state of Indiana is unified in favor of, um, you know, union recognition for the grad workers at IU and better working and living conditions for all workers at IU. And I think the more and more the tides really turn and that becomes apparent, which I think even three years ago, it wasn't clear that that's how people felt, you know, on campus. Um, the more and more you can do to sort of publicly voice your support of that, the, um, the sort of easier it is for people to to get involved and recognize that they're doing something like important and they're part of an important growing movement um to improve yeah the lives and working conditions of of hopefully everyone at iu and again whenever we get raises it seems that other people get raises too so you know it, it has reaper it has sort of effects that go beyond us very good uh any any parting words for the the listeners zara um, well, I, I, I want to say, I think, you know, these, these difficult fights where there's not a clear pathway are absolutely fights worth fighting. And, you know, we're really proud to be part of a growing trend of, you know, like unions like UAW who are taking on auto workers in the South, uh, where, where the conditions are really difficult. You know, we want to sort of support organizing in, in spaces where workers have really suffered from these, you know, um, hostile uh, you know, hostile um, politics to union organizing. And so that's what we are part of and we see ourselves as part of and we want to, you know, support workers who are also engaged in that struggle everywhere. So, yeah, we're, I think, um, yeah, really proud to be in the in the place that we are, even though it means a, a tougher fight. And we're really excited because it's, again, a more creative um and kind of engaging and militant fight that we also get to take on. And thank you, uh, Scott, for for letting me talk about all of this stuff because I think it's you know it's really exciting. I've I've I think it's probably the most fulfilling part of my experience um, in grad school so far to have built something like um, this on campus. Yeah, that's that's neat. You, you probably didn't realize you were you were getting your uh, you know PhD in union organizing. Huh? I had I had no idea. I had no idea. Yeah. Well, best of luck. Um, I, I hope you don't need to engage in a strike action, but if you do, best of luck. You know, solidarity now, solidarity forever. Uh, Zara Anwarzai, thank you so much for joining the Who's Left podcast. Thanks so much. Once again, that was IU PhD candidate and organizing coordinator for the Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition, Zara Anwarzai. Like, she shouldn't have to do this, right? We shouldn't have to have this conversation. I'm glad we did. She's brilliant. I like talking to people smarter than me. But uh, we, as a society, 
shouldn't be putting so many hurdles in front of our best and brightest. We should be clearing the path for them and supporting higher education. Of all kinds, trades, licensed professions, mid-career job retraining, STEM, medicine, the arts, history, real, uncomfortable, honest history, philosophy, and yeah, stuff like gender studies and African diaspora studies and Jewish studies and Asian studies. These things all have value. And as a culture, we should value continual learning. We used to. If you look at the post-World War II order and the, the GI Bill and the 1958 National uh, Defense Education Act in response to the Soviets launching Sputnik. Now, I know the benefits of these government programs weren't felt equally in marginalized communities, but on the whole, the NDEA was one of the most successful legislative initiatives ever. It educated a generation. And sure, it was aimed at the fields we now call STEM in the name of national defense, but not only that. We were also in a culture war against the Soviets, and we built and expanded all these great universities to expand the depth of human knowledge in all fields. But an educated population began to see some of the painful truth about their country and protested to make it better. This made a lot of rich white men uncomfortable, and they spent the next 50 years dismantling publication, uh, excuse me, public education at all levels, but with particular ire for colleges and universities. Through decades of defunding, what used to be a public good has largely become a private commodity paid for with individual debt. This is the curse of neoliberal hypercapitalism, right? Everything for profit, short-term profit, and responsibility falls on individuals. This keeps us financially broke and our solidarity with one another broken. If our government spending priorities reflected our values, it is clear that our state, certainly, and our country on the whole, doesn't really value education as an investment in the future, but as a tool for wealth extraction and social control. We are increasingly being out-innovated by foreign adversaries, and our poorly educated population is literally a national security threat. I mean, Christ, 74 million people voted for Donald Trump. We should be taxing the rich at post-World War II levels and pouring money into post-secondary education, making it free or at least very low cost to students. Trustees and university presidents shouldn't be political appointees. We should be hiring a lot more tenure-track professors and giving them academic freedom, and hiring a lot less adjuncts. Grad students shouldn't have to do the work of faculty in addition to all their own research, but if they do, they should be well compensated for it. They shouldn't have to organize and strike for fair treatment, but if they do organize, they deserve recognition and good faith bargaining. If, like me, you are a student or alumnus of Indiana University, consider contacting President Pam Witten at iuprez at iu.edu, that's I-U-P-R-E-S, and tell her to give full union recognition to Indiana Graduate Workers Coalition. Additionally, contact the university's board of trustees at bdot at iu.edu, that's B-D-O-T, and tell them the same. Are you a donor to the IU Alumni Association, Foundation, or Varsity Club? Consider withholding contributions until the university recognizes the union and loudly make it known you're doing so. Only through solidarity can we defeat powerful moneyed interests. Thanks for listening. Again, subscribe at scotteronrogers.substack.com. Follow me on Facebook, Blue Sky, YouTube, and TikTok at Who's Left and on most other social media sites at scottrodge78. 
If you want to reach me, send me a DM on the socials or email me at scottrodge78 at gmail.com. Until next time, this has been the Who's Left Podcast. I'm Scott Aaron Rogers. Love each other, Indiana. Thank you.